All right. I don't know about you, but when Pastor Paul does that part of the announcements, I'm like, ah, somebody that's 8,000 years old who's been around the block a few times. And no, seriously. No, no, no. You guys think, no, no. Here, here's something that I've learned, seriously, in Gen X, um, Gen Z, all of us, this is like there's something about gray hair that means you've been around the block a few times. So, like, I don't know about you, but if you don't get great hair, that means you already died. So the goal is actually to get old and then share all that wisdom. I, I, this ain't a part of the sermon, but since we're here, I got a reaction from it. In Eastern cultures, to grow wise and old is good. Notice the commercials here in America. The only time it's somebody over 50, it's for like prostate medicine, <laughs> Like, you're basically dying. Everything fun is for young people. I'm trying to tell you, 52, I'm having the most fun I have ever, ever had. So, that was a mini sermon. Let's take a moment to welcome all of our guests who are tuning in online and who are physically here. Thank you for being here. And y'all know how we do. Let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility partnerships in the Carolinas. <clears throat> and to the TC family, it is so, so good to see everybody. Before I jump into our sermon, we're walking through a series called My Name Is, and we're discovering who God is by the names that he reveals to his people. But before we do, I want to share some incredible news, and gosh, I've been sitting on it for a week. So, TC family, you know, and for those of that are guests, you're about to know, we believe that God has put a vision in our heart, and we know it's his because he said, go make disciples, go reach people. Uh, that's already written. And so we have this huge, bold, Jesus-glorifying goal to have four multi-site campuses in 10 years. And people are like, well, why do you want to do that? Because I don't want people to go to hell. How about you? I, I remember year, years ago, someone said, Derwin, don't let the church get too big. I'm like, where did Jesus say that at? There's 8 billion people on the planet. A church of 11,000 is little with 8 billion people. So I'm trying to reach as many people as possible, and I hope you are too, because God is good and God is gracious and I want everybody to know him. I don't want to keep it to myself. So anyway, anyway, so, so, so uh, we did a year-end gift to prepare for Transformation Church Lake Wiley. Now, I was praying and I was like, Lord, I don't know how much we're going to get, but we're going to be faithful to try. Transformation Church, look what y'all did. $718,000, $191.65 to Transformation Church Lake Wiley. Now listen, that is utterly astonishing. What that tells me, number one, is you love Jesus. Number two, you want to reach people. And number three, you believe in what God is doing here. I am, I could barely talk. I was looking at Vicky going, Thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those of you who don't know the history of Transformation Church, we started in a warehouse about a half mile down the road, and God has continuously been faithful. Your generosity and your investment in the kingdom is absolutely incredible. So... We're going to have more information about Transformation Church Lake Wiley coming up. We have a whole bunch of people out there already. It's going to be a missionary outpost to spread the fragrance of Christ and draw more people to Jesus. Also, on Monday, it is Dr. King's birthday. Now, quickly, before you start sending out tweets and you ain't never read none of his stuff, <laughs> Seriously, I know it's like the thing to do. Like, oh, everybody's sending out uh, an Insta. Like, read letters from a Birmingham jail, please. It's free online. Just Google it. It's free. Read it. At least read the man's words instead of just uh, 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 
taking little bits and pieces you see other people do. It will bless your soul. It is a magnus opus of literary genius, and the man wrote it in jail on napkins. So, so I want to encourage you to read it, and it is utterly profound. If Dr. King were alive today, he'd, he'd say, what? We had a black president. Man, I guess it was worth it. Wait, what, what? We, we have what? We have what? I guess we were worth it. So for anybody who thinks things have not changed, you need to talk to some people that grew up in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Things have changed. Now, there's a long way to go, but I don't expect the government to do it. I expect God's people to do it. And I think Jesus does as well. And people forget Dr. King was an American Baptist pastor. Never, ever, ever forget that. Transition here. I'm not saying you need to do this. This is one of my hobbies. I love mafia movies. Now, some of them can be kind of, you know, so I'm 52. I'm an adult. I know how to process stuff, right? So I'm not saying that's what you need to do. Um, and by the way, at the end, it all crumbles apart because evil is evil. But I love the names in mafia movies, though. There's a particular movie, not going to name it, that one of the characters is named Jimmy Two Times. Hey, that's Jimmy Two Times because he does everything two times and he says it two times. <laughs> Forget about it. My best friend uh, was from Queens. He's Italian. I know about pasta, but Basul. Forget about it. Jimmy Two Times. <laughs> You see, his name describes what he did. Well, God's name of Yahweh describes what he did. And the name Yahweh, and we're going to find out its origin, is really impronounceable in the Hebrew. It's four vowels, and the closest we can get is is Yahweh, but it means this, the self-existent, eternal, covenant-keeping God. So when someone says, who created God, you're asking the wrong question because God is the uncreated creator. If someone created God, God would not be God. And the God that we speak of is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he has identified himself as Yahweh. The very first breath we take is his name, whether if we know it or not. Yahweh is a covenant-keeping God. And because of that, he hears your cries and my cries for freedom. On a count of three, say freedom. One, two, three, freedom. Well, why do we need to be free? Well, let's go all the way back to the beginning when God creates his image bearers, Adam and Eve. The Garden of Eden is actually a temple. And Adam and Eve existed to be priests and to and to share God's glory throughout the earth. He wanted his image bearers. It doesn't mean he has a, a, God has physicality. It means the ability to create, to rule, and to reign, to, to spread his fragrance and goodness throughout the earth. He said, be, he said, be multiply, get busy, produce. Yet Adam and Eve decide, you know what, God? We don't like your plan. We want to do our plan. I'm glad humans have stopped doing that now. A beautiful angel who wanted worship himself deceives Adam and Eve, and this horrible thing called sin enters the world. Sin is not just, ooh, I did a boo-boo. Sin is, God, I want my own kingdom. So what does God do? Eventually, he restores things. He raises up a man by the name of Noah. People still trip in translation. They still want to do their thing. He even restores it, starts over. And everything's going good, then Genesis 11 happens and people are building a tower to reach God. Let me give you this insight really quick. The issue wasn't God being with people. The issue was, will you let me reach you or are you going to try to reach me? When you try to reach me, that's you and your own effort. When I try to reach you, that's my grace. Grace has always been in the Bible. So what does God do? He finds a man and he says, yo, Abram, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. And through you, I'm going to bless 
all the families of the earth. Pause here. That word family is the word ethnos. So right at the beginning of the Bible, the Bible talks about race. So if anybody tells you, why do you bring up race? Because God does, and he created the human race, which is colorful, just like this congregation. God is not colorblind. He's color blessed. He doesn't go, Derwin, I didn't know you were black. No, God made the beautiful tapestry, and within every ethnicity is the beautiful Imago Dei, Latin for image of God. So here's the story. God is going, I want to free my people from sin and death. I want to rescue them. And he calls a man by the name of Abraham because he hears our cries. So I'm going to take you to Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. By the way, if you let this get in your heart and your mind, you will understand the entire Bible. You will understand the entire theme of the Bible. You got, why is that important? Because if you don't live in God's story, you're going to ask him to live in your story. If you don't believe me, just watch how you pray. When your prayers are me, when your prayers sound like Johnny Gill, ma, 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 ma. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Don't even worry about it. That's grown folks music. Black people know. Caucasian brothers and sisters, Latinos know. Asians are like, what's happening? Just, it's amazing. Particularly if you're married. Let me move on. Okay. But if your prayers are my, 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 you're asking God to be in your story. And let me tell you, God does not play co-star to anybody. And so what I want to do is I want to help us understand the story of God so when the winds and the rain and the storm comes, you won't freak out. You'll be like, I know the end of the story. So here's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a Jewish Pharisee, a scholar, equivalent to two PhDs. And look what he says here. He says, what's more? The scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles, if you're not ethnic Jew, that's you, right in his sight because of their faith. God makes people righteous in his sight through faith. We don't earn it. Jesus earned it for us and gave it to us. God proclaimed this good news. Here it is. You ready? You ready to hear the gospel? The evangelon, the good news? To Abraham, Old Testament. What was the good news? Long ago when he said, all ethnic groups will be blessed through you. What is the blessing? The blessing is ultimately Jesus would come and he would set us free from sin and death. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a famine in the land. One of the sons named Joseph is sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. He goes to Egypt. He gets thrown in a pit, but he doesn't have a pity party. He parties in the pit. He doesn't have a pity party. He parties in the pit. Let me say it again, because everything in our culture wants to make you a snowflake and make you a victim and make you weak. When God is sovereign and when God is good, what the enemy means for evil, God turns into good. What you think was meant to break you, God will use to remake you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, 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 stop. But not just remake you for you to be a blessing for his glory. So anyway, Joseph rises up the second in command. And he comes up with some great ideas, and all of a sudden, he's like, yo, go find my dad. Bring him to the land. They come, and everything's going great. The Israelites are in Egypt, and they're producing, and everything's going good, and then look what happens. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. Isn't that sobering? People are going to forget you and me, but as long as they remember Jesus, I'm good. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. Paranoid. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. Please understand this. Slavery is not an American invention. Slavery has been around since the dawn of time because man is evil. So the Pharaoh says, you know what? Check this out now. Check this out. 
They're still growing. So women, I want you to kill all the male babies, infanticide, kill the babies. Well, there was this one, and a few others said, nah, we're not doing that. So one kept her baby, hid him for three months, told her daughter, Miriam, go to the river. I'm putting him in a basket. He's gonna float down. Pharaoh's daughter's down there. Let him find him. The baby floats, Pharaoh's daughter names is Moses because she drew him out of the water. She goes, oh, a Hebrew child. And then Miriam, his sister, comes up, and the woman says, hey, um, I want you to take this baby to someone who can raise it, which, by the way, is the baby's mom, and I'm going to pay you for it. So you go from executing babies to getting paid to raise the baby. Okay, years go by. She gives the baby back. Moses grows up in the luxury of Egypt in Pharaoh's court. But one day he looks out and he goes, what's happening to the Hebrews? If you're a Christian, that's the question we ask because Jesus says, love your neighbors as you love yourself. Do we care what's happening to other people? How much do we pray for other people that we pray for ourselves? So you know what Moses does? Moses goes out there and he's like, why are you treating my people this way? And so he kills the Egyptian. Whenever you and I try to do something outside of God's power, even when it's good, it's going to be bad. Hello, control freaks. Pharaoh finds out Moses got to get ghost. Moses has to run. Moses flees. He goes to the land of Midian, and he's there, and he becomes a shepherd, meets a guy named Jethro, like, Jethro, your daughter, fine. They get married. He's shepherding, and all of a sudden, years go by, and he sees a sheep running into a cave, and when he gets there, he sees a burning bush, and it should be on fire, but it's not, and out of the bush, this is holy ground, take off your sandals. And it's Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. And he basically says, I hear the cries of my people. I hear their cries. And I'm going to go deliver them. I don't know, but I think Flavor Flav got this saying from Moses. Because when he heard that from Yahweh, he was like, yeah, boy. <laughs> You'll figure it out. But watch what Yahweh does next. I'm going to go get them, but I'm using you. Family, God always uses people for his redeeming purposes. Stop waiting for someone else. You are that someone. And I know you're going to do like Moses, because I do it too. Well, I, 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 I'm a stutterer. Well, I'm legitimately a stutterer, like legit. I didn't stop stuttering until I came to Christ at 26. So whatever excuse you got, God's like, I know you're weak. That's why I'm choosing you. Matter of fact, the weaker the better, because then you won't get prideful. Whatever excuse we got, he goes, no, my grace is sufficient. Well, I have a pass. My grace is sufficient. Well, my grace, whatever excuse you got, I'm sending you. So watch what Moses does next. Moses learns because Yahweh keeps his covenant promise, he will free you from slavery. He's gonna free the people of Egypt from slavery. So, so, I mean, the Israelites. So the Israelites are in slavery to Pharaoh. And you know what that means? The promise that God made to Abraham to bless the world has stopped because when you're in slavery, you can't do what you were created to do. In the new covenant, the New Testament, we too are in slavery. Now, you may not like this, but it's true. We're in slavery to a dark power called sin. Understand, sin, once again, is not just, ooh, I did a little boo-boo. Sin is, I want to rule. When we even do, quote-unquote, good things, not under God's power and God's grace, it's an offense to God, just like Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve... Their sin was, I'm going to know what's good and wrong. I'm not going to depend on the tree of life. I'm going to be in control. The other is death. Listen, this is going to be, I'm going to hit you right in the face with this because I love you and it hits me in the face. You're born with people taking care of you and cleaning you up, giving you diapers. And if you live long enough, you'll die with people cleaning you up, giving you diapers. The question is, what are you going to do in between? 
We don't have time to play. We need to be free. So, so we are in slavery, and God wants to set us free. So, so let's continue to look at the story of Moses. And God is a, I am your God, I am your father. Check this out now. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. That's the words Yahweh. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God has said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Here it comes, here it comes. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is known by Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. People will make promises and not keep them. I have done it multiple times, and people have done it multiple times to me, but there's only one who will keep his promise. Okay, I'm gonna mess with you here, and I love you, I love you, I love you. God telling you you're gonna get a job or a spouse is not his promise. That's not in Scripture. God telling you you're going to get your dreams, that's not in Scripture. That's prosperity gospel. That's nonsense. That leads to frustration. Here's what God has promised. I promise to crucify your sin. I promise to raise again. I promise to live in you. I promise to do a redemptive work through you wherever you are. That's the promise. Some of you right now may not want to follow Christ now because you're going, wait, wait, hold on, wait. You mean I don't get what I want? No. No. You get what God wants. And best believe, you want what God wants, not what you want. Best believe that. Think about what your kids want. I want candy. You want the sugar diabetes and rotten teeth and a lack of energy. God's like, no, I'm gonna give you some spinach because I got work for you to do. I'm gonna give you some some creatine monohydrate. (laughs) My name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me. He told me, I've been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. By the way, God sees how sin and death is treating us. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. And through Christ, he promises to rescue us. But how does he do it? I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jezebites now live. That is the land of Israel. For us in the new covenant, Israel is not the land we're promised. The whole earth we're promised in the new heavens and new earth. I am your deliverer. I am the one who's going to do a Passover. And by the way, we're going somewhere, but I want to locate us in the story. Exodus 4.23. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and he says, I command you. Can you imagine? I command you. Really? When it's you plus Yahweh. You are in the majority. I command you, let my son go so he can worship me. Guys, this is really important. Notice how Yahweh calls men and women of Israel my son. Why? Because the term son in ancient Hebrew and in the New Testament means my dear dear one, my beloved one. The same way in the New Testament, the church is called the the bride of Christ, men and women called a female. It's not transgender, none of that. No, it's a term of endearment. It's a term of love. Also, who else is the son who came? Jesus. In a moment, we're going to get there, but I don't want to get ahead. But notice, let my son go so he can have his best life now. Let my son go so their dreams can come true. No, let my son go so they can worship me because out of worship comes transformation. Out of transformation turns into mission. You worship God and you go, you are so good. You are so great. You're changing my life. Oh, I want my cousin to be changed. I want my coworker to be changed. I want that girl at school who's mean to everybody to be transformed. And you go on mission, upward, inward, outward. 
One of the ways you know you're really worshiping is not falling down in service. That's cool, but what I want to know is when you get on up, uh, who you're loving, who you're forgiving, who you're not cussing out anymore. By the way, I know some of y'all have some good arguments on the way here. Yeah. You was cussing each other out in Hebrew. And then you get in here, oh, praise God, Brother Derwin. I want to thank the Lord. Can you be honest and go, hey, 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 Lord, I, I, I got a problem and, and, and I need to depend and trust on your grace more because I keep forgetting who I am. I'm a son. I will now kill your firstborn son. In our modern culture, we go, man, that's pretty radical. God would do that. Question, question, who was Pharaoh to try to mess up God's plan to save the world? Why is it that we, as humans, we cancel everybody on social media, but when God wants to cancel sin, we got a problem? Have you noticed that? And, and, and particularly to, to liberal progressive people, you cancel everybody but yourself. Vengeance, justice without Jesus is vengeance and revenge. We live in such a revenge culture. We want to hurt everybody. We want to maim everybody. I am so glad that the only thing Jesus canceled about me was my sin, and I want to do likewise. Oh, uh, y'all, yeah, yeah, I know, I, I get it. I get it. It's better to have revenge, no. Having revenge is like drinking poison and hoping the person you want to kill dies, but you die. But not only you, the people around you are miserable. So what God does is he tells Pharaoh multiple times, if you don't let my people go, some bad stuff going to go down. So every one of the 10 plagues that God does defeats the false gods of Egypt. And the last God to be defeated was the firstborn son. Why? Because the Pharaoh believed he was a God. And what was his son? Son of God. God is desperate to free us. Why? Let's look at the future, which is our present. This is why he does what he does way back in Egypt. But Christ has rescued us. Notice the same language, so so. He has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on a cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Did you hear that? He took upon himself the curse. He took upon himself the curse. For it is written in the scriptures, curse is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed. Notice the language from Genesis. God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. The Holy Spirit is God's presence within us, God's power within us. So on the night that God was going to set his people free, he does what's called the Passover. Exodus 12, 13 explains it on that night. I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am Yahweh. Whenever you see Lord capitalized in Old Testament, that's the replacement word for Yahweh. It is Adonai. If you talk to a Jewish person today, and if they were to say Yahweh, they would put their head down if they're Orthodox and if they are uh, um, if they followed their faith, they'd put their head down because the name is sacred. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the house where you're staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague of death will not touch you when I strike you. So Yahweh says, listen, I want you to get the blood of an unblemished lamb and what I want you to do is I want you to put it over the door, because this is your tattoo, this is your mark, this is your passport, this means that death no longer enslaves you. And the angel of death passes by. But in the New Testament, the new covenant, he doesn't put blood on a door to free us from sin and death he puts blood on you 
and he puts blood on me. And what he says is, sin, you can't hold them anymore. Death, you can't hold them anymore. I took their place. That's where we get the term redemption. It means to buy back a slave. The way Jesus purchased us from slavery to sin and death is he says, I'm going to stand in their place. I'm going to give them grace. I'm going to represent them. Sin and death, do your best to me. I may be down for three days, but you can only keep Yahweh down for three days because on the third day, I am rising up. And guess what? He is rising up to live in you and rising up to live live in me. How does this happen though? Now, all new covenant now. Because Yahweh keeps his covenant promise, he will free you for worship. He will free you for worship. Let me talk to the teenagers. Let me talk to the young people. Listen, Worship through music is wonderful. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. David, when the Ark of the Covenant came back, my man took off all his clothes and danced naked. We're not gonna do that here. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, praise God. I knew this was my kind of church. I knew it. No, no, we're not gonna do that. Nope. <laughs> we're, Worship by music is great, y'all. It, it, it is. I love it. Our worship team is phenomenal. But guys, that's 19 mi minutes on Sunday. Do you know what the greatest worship song you can sing is a life of trust and a life of obedience because of God's grace? That's the true act of worship. So how do we do that? Exodus, Yahweh says, I'm with you. How do we know that Jesus is Yahweh? John 8, 5, 8, and 59. This is important. Why is this important? Because if everything that I'm saying is true, Jesus has to be Yahweh because he's the only one who can free us. Jesus is having a conversation. Let me give you the backstory. It's important. Jesus is having a conversation with the religious establishment, the Sanhedrin, which is a Jewish high court, Supreme Court, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's having a discussion at the temple. Keep in mind, the temple is where God's presence was in the holies of holies. Yahweh was in a building. Watch this. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, ego in me. That's the Greek equivalent to I am Yahweh. And what did they do? So they picked up stones to throw at him because Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. Guys, that's blasphemous. So respectfully, when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your house, you don't have to go, turn off the TV. They're here. <laughs> hey, guys, we laugh, but why do they know Scripture better than us? It's wrong. I mean, you know your football team stats. You know your favorite songs. Like, like, close the door. Like, we have the truth. You know why? Because we're more concerned about doing stuff than worshiping someone. God don't need our help, family. Where were you and I when he created the universe? Where were you and I when he created all of creation? You and I didn't even have a choice in how we would look or who we would be born to or what our story of DNA is. Yet the living God is saying, listen, redemption, I've done it. Resurrection, I've done it. Everything you need, I've done. What I need from you more is not what you do. I'm not your dad impressed with your resume. My son is your resume. My son is your re resume. And he's going, I just want you to know me. That's why Paul says, and I consider all things as lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Isn't he worth it? I mean, you pray for your job, right? Why don't you pray to know him? Well, theology, guys, we're all theologians. We're just good ones or bad ones. You're like, well, I ain't got time. Yeah, you got time. You scroll all day looking at the same Instagram stuff. Hello. <laughs> He's with us. And they pick up stones because they know who he says he is. So watch what he does. The apostle Paul is a Jew. 
He uses Romans 6 to show us our own personal exodus. We know that our old selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Family, this is a flashlight. In order for this flashlight to work, it has to have batteries. When you and I are born, the Bible says we're spiritually dead. There's another word for it. Lost, there's another word for it. Sick, there's another word for it. Estranged from God. When we are born, we're born in God's image, but it's like having a flashlight with no batteries. Why does Jesus say, you must be born again? Please understand this. To be born again means this. That when you go, God, I need forgiveness. I believe that you died for me and rose again. There's a supernatural exchange that takes place. God in Christ takes your death and puts it on the cross and takes Jesus' resurrection life and puts it in us. And so here's what happens. As you begin to walk by faith, you go, wait, hold a second. I, wait a second, something's new in me. Something, like, I never wanted to be a preacher. I grew up as a compulsive stutterer, but all of a sudden, I started seeing myself. I saw y'all before we ever were, back in 2001. I'm like, Vicky, I'm starting to have these visions of me preaching. Does God know I'm a stutterer? I saw myself writing books. I saw myself as a husband and a father. Where did that come from? God gives us new life. But here's what happens, though. When life hits us hard, we start doing the things we used to do before we found Christ. That's called flesh patterns. You have a new life, family. He's literally given us a new life. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. That's the word redemption. We were, we were set free from the power of sin. In a moment, we're gonna see how we are. And since we died with Christ, we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. Notice this word here, we are sure. Let me say this lovingly, let me say this respectfully. In 2024, in Christianity, there's this kind of like, yeah, it's good to have doubt. Let's start doubting our doubts. I don't know about you, but Jesus is worthy to be trusted whether if I feel it or not. Because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. Watch this now. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. Paul wants us to get this. He wants us to get it. In a moment, I'm going to give us very practical here. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So also you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Two illustrations and we're done. Let's pretend like right here is Egypt. And in Egypt is whatever historical sins we have. I'm not gonna name them because we all have them. Whatever those habitual patterns of destruction are, right? So, so when we come to Jesus, he makes us alive and he goes, okay, come to the promised land with me. Just hold my hand, just walk. And here's what you and I do. The temptation comes. To be new in Christ doesn't mean the temptation does not come. Listen, if you're new in Christ, the temptation to sin is not going to go away, but the power of Christ in you to win grows as you trust him more. The temptation of sin doesn't go away, but the power of Christ gives you the ability to win as you trust him more. Notice what I'm saying. As you trust him more, what you and I do is we do this. Hey, Egypt, I'm free from dot, dot, dot. I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna do this. I, I did it again. Why are you going back to Egypt? You're dead. Let me say it again. Don't go where you're dead. Practically, this is what this means. If I'm at the gym and a woman is basically wearing a painted on underwear, just saying. I mean, fellas, don't do it. We don't need to see all that. It's true. I don't go, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna look, I'm not gonna look, I'm not gonna look. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna look. So you know what I, I do? 
I get my gluteus maximus on that treadmill and I start going in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am chosen. I am redeemed. I am loved. I am forgiven. I'm a temple of the Spirit. Here's the problem with preaching grace. You want to be in control. You want pride. You know what makes you overcome sin? It's saying, I don't even worry about Egypt. I am marching to the promised land. I am redeemed. I am free. Guys, I promise you, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in men's groups where, where men have been in groups together for years. And all of a sudden, grace breaks loose and they be... They start confessing all their years of pornography and all the men are going, I didn't know, why didn't you tell me? Here's why, because we're in Egypt going, I'm not gonna look at porn, I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna do this. Who's the focus on? Can you show me anywhere in that scripture where it says for you and I to focus on us? You know what's gonna make you sin less? Christ, calling on his name, setting your mind to him. Don't go back to Egypt, family. People ask, well, Derwin, how, how, do you, how do you overcome sin? I go, I don't. Jesus already has. They go, what do you mean? I go, well, according to scripture, this is what he says. So I'm not gonna go back to Egypt. I remember years ago, our kids were young. Vicky and I went back to Egypt. We were arguing about something. And next thing I, I knew, Presley was holding Jeremiah. They were both crying because we were, we didn't, we've never cussed each other. We've never spoke defamely of each other. We've never done that. But we were loud and our kids were terrified and their crying made us stop to go, what are we doing? You know what we're doing? We're in Egypt going, I'm going to be right. You're going to be wrong. Stop going to Egypt. You're not there anymore. When those temptations come, be like, you can tempt me all you want to, but I'm not going to fight you. You're dead. When you and I sin, if you're a, a Christian, you know what that's like? It's like you and I going to a cemetery like, what's up? What's up? Against air. That's exactly what we're doing. I'm just teaching you the text. Last illustration. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Consider. Are there any accountants watching online or here physically? If you're an accountant, raise your hands. If you, there you go. Any, any more accountants? My man, yeah, you be, yeah, hook a brother up. Some Bojangles. Okay, check this out. That word is a word that accountants would use to get their books right. So check this out. Two plus two equals four. That's true, regardless of how I feel. Two plus two equals four. You are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ because it's true. So you're gonna leave here today and you're not gonna go back to Egypt and fight something that's dead. You're gonna be alive to Christ. When those thoughts come, the scene of the crime is your mind. You're going to start worshiping. You're going to start praising. If all you know is Jesus loves me, that's enough. Set your mind to him by the power of the Spirit. That may mean you may need to call some friends. Back in my NFL days, after I had gotten saved, I had a, te a teammate who struggled with porn. And so he would call me, hey, man, I'm, I'm really struggling. And either we'd pray on the phone or I'd come to his house. That's why we need community. You need people around you to champion you, to encourage you in the gospel, not in your flesh, going, ooh, girl, you're enough. No, you're not enough. If you were enough, you wouldn't need Jesus. I ain't enough, that's why I need Jesus. None of us are enough, that's why we need Jesus. It's okay to go, I'm not enough, because he is more than enough. We need a generation of people who admit I'm not enough, but Jesus is enough. Are you ready to have the light turned on? Are you tired of walking in slavery? So we're gonna, we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for the blood to not just be over our door, but to be over our heart. Are you ready to be set free today? 
Listen, I know some of you, I don't know who you are, but I sense in your mind, so you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your kids are watching. Your kids are watching. I'll say it one more time. Your kids are watching. This ain't about you. Remember we started 40 some minutes ago, Abraham's blessing through you? God didn't just redeem me for me. It's not about me, and it's not about you. There's a generation killing themselves, longing for love, longing for grace, longing for mercy. We don't got time to play. His grace is sufficient. His grace is available. His love is present. Take hold of it today. Take hold of it today. I am tired of meeting with kids on the verge of suicide. It's you, parents. It's your role. It's your job. It's grace. I don't want to play church. You, you're looking at Republicans and Democrats. Would you cut it out and look to Jesus? And here's the thing. God is not asking you to do it. His son has done it. Call on his name. Father, in Jesus' name, the name of the one who set us free, the name of the one who broke our chains, the name of the one who didn't put blood over our door, but over us. Make us bloody again, because the blood will never lose its power. The blood will never lose its power. In this moment right now, I don't know who you are or where you are, but Jesus is saying, come to me. Let me set you free. Are you ready to be set free? It's an act of faith. Would you trust him today? In the silence of your heart, would you say this to him today, King Jesus? I want to be set free. Today, King Jesus, I want to know you. I want your blood to forever forgive me, to make me a son. I want your blood to give me a new power. I want your resurrection life to live in me. Today, Lord, I choose not to go to Egypt. I choose to hold your nail-pierced hand to the promised land. We pray this in Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Can we give the Lord a round of applause? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you prayed with me, fill out the connection card. If you're watching online, there's a QR code. You can fill out that. Let us know you prayed to receive Christ. We want to help you grow in your faith. Here's our action step, our, our soul tattoo. Live in the power of Jesus as someone who's been set free. Live in his power. Action step. Find your place at TC by visiting transformationchurch.tc. Find your place. We want to help you grow because God wants to bless the world through you. Pastor Paul here, and I want to thank you for joining us online today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or you have questions about the service, we want to encourage you to scan the QR code on the device or screen in front of you, and we'll make sure to connect with you regarding your decision or question. Also, if you're ever in the Indian Land, South Carolina or Charlotte area, we want to invite you to come join us in the house on Sundays. Finally, we want to close this service like we do all of our services, and that's with our benediction. Our benediction is a good word, and our good word is our vision. And together we say upward, inward, outward, transformers roll out. The reason we do that is upward, we love God completely. 
Inward, we love ourselves correctly, and outward, we love others compassionately. And I've invited some friends to join me today to come close our service, and the reason we do that is because this is just the oh. And now it's time to go play the Yay. All right, on the count of three, stand wherever you are today and join us in our benediction. One, two, three. Upward, inward, outward, transformers, roll out. Have a great day.